Well, show. My name is Jerry Miller. Thank you kindly for watching us on a Friday. It's great to connect with you um, live in downtown Charlottesville. Sorry, my uh, my phone is blowing up with some news that I'm trying to deliver to you from the newsmaker herself. Um, so I'm working the phones while doing the program to see if I can get the story to you today, or if this uh, it's deal flow. It's from business. Um, from real estate, if this is something that I'm going to be relaying to you early next week. Uh, I promised her this deal would close, and the closing is, I think, happening right now, and she's letting me know. Um, all right, lots to cover on today's program. Live in downtown Charlottesville, our studio on Market Street in the Macklin Building. We are um, excited to connect with you. Take a look at the screen for today's headlines. We're going to talk about... Um, the ADL, and Judah, you set the stage of what the ADL is. Okay, you don't have to do it now. I'm going to do the headlines, but set the table for the first uh, topic, and uh -huh. then I'll offer commentary. The ADL offered a grade for the University of Virginia, and that grade, when it applied to anti-Semitism on campus, as they called it, we know it's grounds, the ADL graded Thomas Jefferson's University with an F with an F. Some of the other noteworthy or notable schools that are also graded with an F, MIT, Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, UCAL Santa Barbara, UNC Chapel Hill, UVA. F, anti-Semitism. We'll talk about that today on the program. Also, conversations on today's show will include a headline I found compelling, Judah found compelling, dozens of new jobs coming to Orange County thanks to a $41 million economic development story. That topic on today's program. We'll talk a developer pivoting his efforts from a downtown mall apartment tower to a 160-room boutique hotel. That story on today's program. Charlottesville Middle School looking for a new mascot. Judah will set the stage on that storyline. I'm going to give you, courtesy of Charlottesville tomorrow, a snapshot at the budget in the city over the last five years and how it has ballooned. And we will unpack the revenue verticals that have allowed to the ballooning or inflation of the budget in this fine and fair city. We'll talk summer lifeguards. Yet again, the city has a summer lifeguard shortage. And I'm going to take the storyline of a summer lifeguard shortage, a job that's tailor-made for teenagers, and I'm going to use it as an opportunity to have the conversation from both sides of the aisle about teens in today's world and the commitment to working a job that is not tied to being on a screen. That topic on today's show and news and notes from Judah Wickhauer and I, including the Dogwood Memorial, making it more accessible. Folks, we are a hop, skip, and a jump from the Charlottesville Police Department, less than two miles from Thomas Jefferson's University, the Rotunda, the John Paul Jones Arena, and Scott Stadium, one block removed from the courthouse that is Albemarle County and the city of Charlottesville, and just off the downtown mall in a building that we have worked our tails off to own a good chunk of the Macklin Building on Market Street. Judah Wickhauer is not only the executive, eh, not only the producer and director, but I'm proud to call a co-host. Judah Wickhauer, who was crossing the road yesterday right in front of Ginny Hu and her family. Apparently. Ginny Hu connects with us on Twitter. We appreciate your support on that platform, Ginny Hu. Judah crossed right in front of the road with Liza in front of us today. And let us know. And I promised I would let you know that Ginny saw you crossing the road. I wish she'd roll down her window and yelled at me. Give you a hoo. <laughs> Judah welcomes all greetings when you see him around town. He most often will be with the beloved I Love Seville mascot, Liza, a rescue from the Fluvanna County nonprofit, Caring for Creatures, a nonprofit that is headed by an angel that walks this earth Definitely. and Mary Burkholz. All right, my friend, it's Friday, your favorite day of the week. My favorite day of the week is Monday. Yours is Friday. That might be the difference between a team member and an owner, um, but such is life. Yeah. I, I don't fault you for Friday being your favorite. Um, set the stage for our number one headline with a lower third first on screen. 
And then second, the ADL grades Thomas Jefferson's University of Virginia with an F as it applies to anti-Semitism on grounds. First, I want you to do the who, what, when, where, why. The ADL, describe it to us, and then tell us about the storyline. So the ADL is the Anti-Defamation League. <clears throat> there's, uh, there's some disagreement over, uh, over their grading system and, uh, and how they go about making their decisions. But if you, go to the, uh, if you go to this page on the campus anti-Semitism report for University of Virginia, they have some compelling evidence. Uh, UVA officials acknowledge there have been dozens of recent reports of anti-Semitic activity. One Jewish student said he has received death threats since October 7th, was physically assaulted while counter-protesting at an anti-Israel walkout, and has been called anti-Semitic slurs. This prompted the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights to open a Title VI investigation against UVA in December of last year. Uh, and UVA students also passed a referendum this spring calling for divestment from companies that do business with Israel. Prior to the referendum, an art history professor at the college canceled her class in solidarity with the divestment movement. I don't know if I would say the, um, the referendum to divest from companies doing business with Israel is... I don't know if I would necessarily classify that as anti-Semitic. Let's, we're we're going to offer commentary. We'll stick with the, okay. the facts and the story first before we offer commentary and our opinion on this story. UVA and F, along with UNC, MIT, Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, Tufts, Michigan State, SUNY Purchase, uh, University of Massachusetts, Amherst. Um, I mean, we got some... These are the, the best of the best when it comes to colleges and universities. And unfortunately, the best of the best are being graded with an F by a third party. Some would say that third party has an agenda. We'll tell you about the agenda potentially on the program. But I think we have a, a, a few more who, what, when, where, why facts to relay to the viewers and listeners. Show is yours, Judah Wickhauer. What else should get out there? Um, I don't, I'm not sure what specifics exactly you want. Um, it's a complex issue that I gave most of, of what, uh, the ADL has on the subject, uh, what's happening on campus. Um, the Anti-Defamation League based out of New York, Manhattan, Third Avenue, mm -hmm. this is in the national if not the global news cycle right now. Now, we can go down the road of our commentary and thoughts on this story. Um, what we were talking in our pre-production pre meeting, I thought you and I had good uh, commentary to offer the viewers and listeners. I thought your commentary on this was very compelling. I'll listen to learn. Um, and I've learned a bit more. Uh, a lot of... It, it's, it's hard to not explain that this is a complex issue. There are people that are probably definitely anti-Semitic. There are people that are just against what Israel is doing uh, in Palestine or in the, you know, Gaza and, and the West Bank. There are people that are, at, like you said, as we, were, as we were talking before the show, there are people that are pro-Palestinians, but not necessarily pro-Hamas. Uh, but it's very hard to uh, it's very hard to separate the Palestinians from their government, which is Hamas, who's got in their in their founding charter that part of their their goal is the destruction of Israel and all the uh, the people there. So it's a tough issue. There are people on campuses across America who are who are protesting either against Israel or for Palestine. And I believe a lot of it gets very mixed up. Um, in this case with UVA, I think that uh, one of the big problems is they haven't come out against uh, the actual anti-Semitic actions that have, uh, that have shown up around campus. There it is. There it is. Freaking there it is right there. 
I don't need Jim Ryan. I don't need the the Board of Visitors and Rector Robert Hardy. I don't need the brass, the executives, the C-suite at the University of Virginia to pontificate or to or to offer perspective on Hamas and Gaza and Israel and Palestine and this war. Yeah. I do not need that. What I do need them to do is to say, these students on grounds at the University of Virginia that are being targeted, this is wrong. And we will do what it takes, whatever it takes to protect them and to kibosh and squash anti-Semitic language behavior from either our professors, other students, or whoever it may be. Yeah. I don't Amen. need City Council of Charlottesville to issue a proclamation or to, to, to spend time in council chambers during a meeting saying in, in pomp and circumstance, dog and pony fashion, what we do on this dais is going to impact Hamas and Palestine and Israel. That's what they did a couple of weeks ago. They took a vote and said, we're going to take a stand against what's happening in the Middle East right here in Charlottesville. Give me a break. What are you doing here? Give me a break. Okay? But what I do need counsel and what I do need the Board of Visitors to do and Jim Ryan's office to do and the Board of Supervisors in Almoral County to do, to say, look, in the place that we govern, oversee, over, have oversight of or manage, we're not going to have anti-Semitic behavior or any racial yeah, tolerance we, at all. It, a, any races, racism at all. August 11th and 12th are still, sadly, fresh in our minds. And... I don't see this as being a whole lot different. If there it you, is. If you hate somebody, the Anti Defamation League would not grade UVA <laughs> with an F as they have done now if Jim Ryan or the Board of Visitors had utilized their platforms and said, We're not going to tolerate this. But silence and no comment is a statement. Yeah. And that's what we have. And as a result, the Anti-Defamation League has said UVA and Thomas Jefferson's University is one of the worst in the country when it comes to anti-Semitism. Yeah. There's the story in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. And I hope this compels or motivates or influences President Ryan. And, and I'll tell you this, Razorblade Burt Ellis of the Board of Visitors... The gentleman who traveled across state lines with a razor blade to try to cut off a, a, a vulgar sign off the door of a UVA lawn student. You could say what you want about Bert Ellis. You could say what you want about the Jefferson Council. You could say what you want about how they're going about doing this. What Bert Ellis is doing on the Board of Visitors where he's saying enough is enough with anti-Semitism, you have to applaud him for that. Yeah. He may not be doing it the way we think is the right way, but he's going balls to the wall and taking a stand against it. No doubt. You have a defamation league, the defamation league. Anti-defamation league. The anti-defamation league. Saying what's going on in Charlottesville is, is, is an F. Yeah. Okay? And I'm passionate and fired up about this topic. For, I, I, I don't even use the word fortunately. UVA is not the only one in this mix. What's the unfortunate scenario is these positions of president at some of these noteworthy universities, Harvard is in graded in F. Princeton's graded in an F. MIT's graded in an F. UVA's graded in an F. UNC Chapel Hill's graded in an F. Mm. Stanford graded in an F. These yeah. positions of president are incredibly lucrative. You're talking a million dollars in compensation with perks and benefits, well over a million with, with the fact that you include free housing and a mansion, Cars Hill, that they've become less about being an educator and the management of education and more about navigating political headwinds and trying to be as so neutral when it comes to these headwinds and staying away or from or, or out of the crosswire fire of these storylines that your silence is 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 deafening. deafening. That's yeah. what's happening here. Yeah. And the only reason and, and I highlighted the the Boston Marathon run for Jib Ryan 
and the, the running for the UVA Children's Hospital, the Boston Marathon, just transpired. The reason I highlighted that Ryan's running in the Boston Marathon for the UVA Children's Hospital is he's a smart man. He utilizes his position to make sure the word is out of his efforts running for sick kids and one of the most noteworthy marathons in the world because this builds equity, goodwill. And that equity and goodwill is currently insulating him or, or, or the Teflon or the protection for his silence, his deafening stance on anti-Semitism at the university that he oversees. And students on grounds at the University of Virginia, the ones that are, I don't think all the students on grounds at the University of Virginia that are in this crossfire are anti-Semitic. Right. I think a lot of the students that are in this crossfire at the University of Virginia are, are pro-Palestine. They could be anti-Hamas. Yeah. They could be neutral about Israel. They can be concerned with what Israel is doing, killing boatloads of innocent people. They can say, I am pro the innocent people in Palestine, and I believe they can be. I believe they can be. We don't like what's happening to vulnerable, innocent people in this, these terroristic attacks. Yeah. I ran with the drones on Israel just this past weekend. You can say that, and you can say that, and, and you can be right. But what you can't do when you're the president or you're in charge of a prominent platform like UVA is say nothing. Yeah. I'm passionate about this. You, you want to offer any perspective before we get off topic? Viewers and listeners, your thoughts on this topic. Donnell, uh, welcome to the program. Hop, we love you. Bill McChesney, Andre Xavier, James Watson, Johnny Ornalis, Aaron King, Jason Howard, Dean Russell. Anyone who wants to offer perspective, Ray Cadell, Carol Thorpe, welcome to the broadcast, Lisa Costello, anyone. The silence is deafening, I find, so weak, backbone-esque. Yeah, I think that, uh, as we've said, there, there's a, there are a, a wide range of opinions, and it's fine to uh I, you know, I think it's fine if people want to want to protest for the safety of the innocent Palestinian people but when you make attacks on Jewish students you put a, the lie to uh to this just being about Palestine and and another thing that really I thank you another thing that really irks me is tenured, and, and this I'll catch, I'll catch heat for what I'm about to make. Tenured professors feeling so confident in their tenure, the fact that they can't get pink slipped, that they will utilize their position, which is a position that is platformed because of the UVA brand, to make comments or mm -hmm. to shape the next generation of thinkers, their students, in ways that are clearly anti-Semitic. Hateful. I mean, Hateful. What, and, and, and completely ignored by their bosses for such comments. You look, <laughs> at some, you look at publicly traded companies, noteworthy traded companies that have fired employees for their stance on this. Yeah. And here the University of Virginia with some professors under their purview, will do nothing, either because of weak backbones, because they don't want to be in the political crossfire, or because of the nuance of tenure. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's crazy that in, in our world today, in America today, where, where hate speech is so, not just frowned upon, rightly uh, uh, denounced, uh, that there's so little said about uh, anti-Semitic actions, words, and behavior. John Blair, thank you. Stephanie Wells-Rhodes, thank you for watching. Logan wells Claylo, thank you for watching. Carol Thorpe, Ray Cadell, thank you for watching. 
Stacy Baker Patty, thank you for watching. We'll go to number two in the family, then we'll go to number one, Deep Throat. Deep Throat, welcome back from our nation's capital. Number two in the family, John Blair's photo on screen, if you could, please, sir. Jerry, I think Judah makes an astute point. UVA is unique in this story. While a lot of these universities and questions of anti-Semitism revolve around 10-7, UVA is unique due to A-12-2017. The synagogue in Charlottesville was targeted only seven years ago. Anti-Semitism is simply much greater of a concern here than in any other area due to that fact. Mm. 100%. Um, I'll take it a step further. We had, and I'm not going to utilize her name, we had a prominent University of Virginia official on this network. And the topic about being a Jew in Charlottesville and in Albemarle County came up after the show. And her response was, there are so few of us in this community. And because we're so few in number, basically alluding to our heads always on a swivel. Hmm. That's a shame. But makes sense. Safety in numbers. I'm not, I just, it, regardless of religion, skin color, or ideology, your safety to walk around the town and counties that we love in Central Virginia sh should be second nature. Should be obvious. And right now, that's not the case. And the president's doing nothing about it. Yeah. All right. Next topic, if you could. Set the stage for a dozens of new jobs. And then we'll, we'll, in fact, let's go to, before we go to the Orange County $41 million topic, let's do the budget story. I should have slid this to the two slot. That's on me. The snapshot of the Charlottesville City budget over the last five years, if you could put that lower third on screen. I'll set the stage on this one. Charlottesville Tomorrow um, is a nonprofit news organization, and I've watched this news organization change in its coverage, its content, significantly over the last 10 to 15 years. When Brian Wheeler was at this organization and his lead reporter, Sean Tubbs, was churning copy, Charlottesville Tomorrow did a fantastic job of covering hard news, in particular hard news tied to government and the cross-section of development and government. Charlottesville Tomorrow's content model has changed, and it's changed because they are now pursuing grant money mm -hmm. from large grant providers, and the providers that are providing the money uh, are doing so to nonprofits that cover diversity, equity, and inclusion. As a result, Charlottesville Tomorrow's content model has no longer hard news and the cross-section of real estate development and government. They, however, Charlottesville Tomorrow, in their newsletter today, which I subscribe to, released um, an analysis on the Charlottesville City budget over the last five years. I find this content compelling. Hmm. Much like Deep Throat, who's back from D.C., he likes to look at data over a period of time. And that's exactly what Charlottesville Tomorrow did in their newsletter. I'm going to relay that to you and then offer my commentary. That's what this show is about. We take news, we set the table with the story, and then Judah and I offer our commentary on that table, on that hard news, and encourage you, the viewer and listener, to offer share your opinions and perspective on what we're discussing with that very topic. So I'm going to set the stage. Here's from Charlottesville tomorrow. In the last five years, Charlottesville City's general fund expenses have grown by 25%. You should listen to this. From $189 million in 2020 to $253 million projected in 2025. 
It's a 25% increase in five years, taxpayer dollars. The general fund is where most of the city's local tax revenue goes, and it is used to cover city operations. Money is also transferred from the general fund to the capital improvement fund to cover large construction projects like stormwater pipes or a new middle school. We're about to talk about a middle school. A new middle, middle school. What's that? A new middle school. That's what they're talking about. The money goes to capital improvement projects like a new middle school. Yeah. Some of the extra cash came from tax increases. Here are the tax increases over the last five years. This is according to Charlottesville Tomorrow. In 2020, the meals tax increased from 5% to 6%, and the lodging tax from 7% to 8%. 2021 unchanged, 2022 unchanged. In 2023, the real estate tax increased by one cent per 100 of assessed value, and the meals tax increased by half a percentage point. 2024 unchanged, and in 2025, a whopping increase. Real estate tax will increase by two cents per $100 of assessed value. Meals tax by 1%. Personal property tax by 20 cents per $100 of value. And the lodging tax by a full percentage point. They went real estate tax, meals tax, personal property, that's automobiles and cars and vehicles, and lodging. All four levers. First time four levers in the last five years were increased or pulled. Mm -hmm. All this is going on at the same time that assessed values on homes have skyrocketed, yeah. which is a huge driver of revenue for the city. Mm -hmm. Huge driver of revenue. Here's my take, and one counselor is already alluding to this in council meetings, and I hope more of them relay or share this perspective that I'm about to pass along. If you keep going down this road and pushing this road, you will have the opposite effect of what you campaigned upon. Yeah. You are doing school reconfiguration at Buford to help kids that need a better learning environment. But if you keep going down this road, the kids that need the better learning environment at Buford won't be able to afford to live here. You got private schools all over the area that are increasing enrollment. Miller School just purchased an elementary school and weaved it into its educational model. Yeah. And Miller, over a very short period of time, wants to 2x its student body to in Crozet to 500. Yeah. An aggressive growth strategy for the Crozet private day and boarding school. Mm -hmm. Let's get to Deep Throat, his photo on screen. Ah, oh, God, I love Deep Throat. Get the uh, graph that he's got on screen and, the tw and, uh, and my Twitter DMs if we can. The one for, is it a new one? It's this one, yeah. He sent two today. Deep Throat, you've made two okay. shows better today. Real Talk with Keith Smith, which we talked about that Redfin uh, chart you sent me, and this one. Tell me when that's on screen. He's got fiscal year 2015 Charlottesville City to fiscal year 2025 Charlottesville City change in budget lines by category. Police, fire, school contributions, health, um, infrastructure, transportation, management, the CIP contribution, debt service, and then he's got his own analysis. Let me know when that's on screen. This is fantastic. He also says this. Charlottesville is the least Jewish place I have ever lived. The old joke is that the minimum number of synagogues is two. One to join and one to boycott. Yeah, we are. We only have one. What's he saying here? We are disputatious. In all of Central Virginia, we only have one synagogue, he highlights it. I believe, and, and I don't know for certain, in fact, I think you've referenced this to me in the past, that you are Jewish. I am, I, 
Jewish ancestry. No, I meant oh, oh. deep throat. Sorry. Yeah, you've told your story here. You're, you're much like me, a religious mutt. I'm a religious mutt. I grew up, I grew up, I went to a Catholic school for most of my life. I grew up Southern Baptist and was raised in a Jewish neighborhood. My family has, has mostly been, I mean, we had Christmas trees at my... Uh, at but you've my, never sat on the lap of Santa Claus. That is Or taken true. a picture with Santa. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're getting off track. Can you get the chart on screen? Oh, uh, I got to... Let us know when it's on screen. This partic- we're doing this on the fly for you. This is worth seeing. He says this as the chart comes on screen. I was surprised how much infrastructure and transportation spending had increased, but it tells you, it tells you that it is not just about the quantity of money spent, but the efficiency of the spending. It is harder to assess, but I think we have an efficiency of spending problem. Very low internal capacity, so we have to use outside consultants and cro- contractors for everything, and they rob us blind. There's a lot of truth to that. In fact, the acting city, the city attorney right now is on leave. And there's an acting city attorney, which is a law firm. That law firm... Here's the chart. The chart's on screen? All right, everyone look at the screen. This is courtesy of Deep Throat, who's back from D.C. Welcome back, Deep Throat. You were missed. I'll set the stage for those that are streaming the show in their car riding around town. He has put together a fiscal year 2015 to fiscal year 2025 change in Charlottesville budget lines. What number, what budget line has increased the most over the last 10 fiscal years, Judah? Management. 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 And he says this, and he's throwing shade to one of Charlottesville's loudest and most vocal. How would you characterize uh, livable Charlottesville co-chairman Matthew Gillikin? Oh, your, your words, not mine. How would you characterize the co-chair of Urbanist Policy Group, Livable Charlottesville, Matthew Gillikin. I'm not sure that I would. I, I occasionally see what he puts on Twitter, but I don't think I know enough about the guy to accurately characterize him. Okay, fair enough. Deep Throat says, the Gillikins of our town say we need higher taxes because of the schools, and the only thing we can cut is police. But what has ballooned is the management line. Yeah. How much of the money, you know, when <clears throat> I've, I've brought up in the past uh, information about, you know, our schools getting more money from, from uh, Virginia government and, uh, and gotten some pushback. And I think, uh, I think the people that push back are, are right because do we know where that money is going? Our, our local schools have, have uh, declined in quality over the years, and how much money do you throw at it, and how many more administrators do you hire uh, before you, you realize that uh, maybe, we're, maybe we're taking the wrong tack on, on some of this? And he attributes the management line ballooning to paid consultants and third parties offering advice and strategy because perhaps he says, this is deep throat, that those on the job don't have the institutional memory and or skill set. And as a result, third parties are brought in at extremely high hourly rates. Yeah. And we've seen consultants hired over the years. We have consultants for bridge projects, mm-hmm. consultants for school projects, consultants for sidewalk and bicycle lanes. Consultants for transportation. We have consultants for music venues. Consultants for who to hire. We have consultants on, for who to hire. City manager hiring consultants. We had one city manager who quit the day before he was supposed to take the job. And still got a, quite a bit of a payout, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think he got a, <laughs> quite a bit of payout. He didn't? Mark Woolley. Uh, maybe I'm thinking of someone The Pennsylvania else. executive that quit the day before he was supposed to take the job. Would you hold a headhunting firm accountable if who they picked or helped pick ended up 
quitting the day before his job is supposed to start. Sure, but good luck getting your money back. The point he's making, some in the community are quick to target the police yeah. and say pull from their 19 million, whatever the number is. And that's less about utilizing the money for schools or other line items and more about their political stance yeah. on police themselves. Defund the police. There it is. And we'll catch some heat for that. But hey, the reason you listen to the program is for a fresh and different voice. And we will not change that. And you can go with any voice you want. This is mine. This is the voice. You know, I'm going to stay true oh, to the voice. I'm against defunding the police. I'm, I'm also for uh, transparency in, in the police department so that, uh, so that the people of this city or any city can... Uh, can feel safe with them. We'll get to other comments here in a matter of moments. He's got one more. Then I'll get to Carol Thorpe of Jack Jewett's district. This is what he says. The school's budget is a total enigma. Mm. We spend like 4,000 more per student per year on instruction than Almoro County, and yet the student-teacher ratios are the same. The teacher salaries in the city have generally been a little lower, and the admin count is pretty similar. So how is the city's instructional budget so much higher? I am guessing the same thing, consultants. But the budget is not detailed enough for me to figure it out. Hmm. Good perspective from him. I wonder if that's by design. I, did you answer your own question? Did I? Did you? <laughs> I wonder if it's by design. <clears throat> you know the answer to that. Right? Uh, no, I don't. You don't think it's ambiguous on purpose? I think it's quite possible it is, but uh, to say that it's 100% for that reason, I, I can't say that. Carol Thorpe, Queen of Jack Jewett, her photos on screen. Photos, uh, the power ranking, ilovesebill.com forward slash viewer rankings. Earlier this week when I said bend over Charlottesville in anticipation of the tax increases, I was not kidding. On yesterday's show, we learned that Millie Joe's coffee, and we had, I mentioned on yesterday's show, early stage conversations with this business about potentially brokering their sale. We could not agree to the terms of us representing them to help them sell their business. Yesterday, we let you know the news that at the end of May this year, Millie Joe's will be closed forever. And the third generation owners have said it is in part because of the escalating nature of meals tax keeping customers away. Yeah. The uh, Facebook page of Uma's was, uh, had a bit to say about the uh, upcoming taxes. Of course, this was back in, in March. Before the meals tax was approved. Yep. The meals tax increase was approved. Uma's on Water Street and the old Mono Loco and Moe's location on Water Street. They, were they put an infographic together that both Judah and I found compelling. Mm -hmm. Found I was impressed with the graphic design work. Yeah, very much so. A lot of the stuff that we do, I was impressed with the, the product that they produce. They spoke of the vulnerable nature or the damning nature, maybe that's a better word, mm -hmm. of increasing the meals tax. That was prior to the green light vote, yes, to increase this yeah. tax lever. That was, I think, when it first started uh, entering the conversation. Meals tax was increased. Guess what? Umas is for sale. You now have businesses in the market in the city, Millie Joe's Coffee Roasters, saying, we are closing our doors in part because of this. Mm. Umas, a month prior, roughly, to this vote, saying, don't do this, it will hurt us. Right after the vote was approved, they announced they're selling their restaurant. Yeah. And not only selling, but moving to Philadelphia out of the market. This after investing hundreds of thousands of dollars and, most importantly, their time over a very short period of time. There's B. Haluska again. Brian, hello. <laughs> he looked over to us. Did you he's, see? He was staring you down. He was looking at us. You think, I think we should play a game. It's almost like, uh, where's Brian? Right. 
Someone's got to be telling him every time. Yeah. He's like, dude. Like, they, t- they talk you, about you, you when gotta you walk stop, by. You got to stop walking by. I love Seville. <laughs> We're going to do this. Every time, every time, we should be like, uh, it should be like a drinking game. Anytime Brian Haluska walks by, we have to take a shot on the show. Ooh. Too early? I don't think my wife would approve of that. Anytime Brian Haluska walks by, we have to do something like 10 push-ups or 20 push-ups or a bunch of jumping jacks. My point is this, before I get we'll off be topic. will be ripped. Before, I get, before <laughs> I get off topic even more. It's not only, they're not only lobbying against it, they're potentially closing, they, they are closing in part and selling in part because of it. I mean, this is a great line. I'm on, I'm on the UMA's uh, Facebook page. And, and part, anyone can find this on the UMA's Facebook page. Yeah, part of what they have to say is, are you one of the people that complain on Reddit about it being too expensive to eat out in this town? Are you one of the people that complain to your boyfriend, girlfriend, waifu, mother, brother, sister, cousin, friend about it being too expensive to eat out in this town? Great news. The city wants to make it more expensive to eat out in this town with a proposed increase to the meals tax. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that pretty much says it. You know what the crappy part about this is? As you lose the, as these businesses close the door, the city gets less revenue. It's not seeing the forest through the trees. Yeah. When we're, we're in the landlord business, 24 tenants on our roster, 24. Mm-hmm. There are many years that go by with our tenants where I choose not to use the 5% escalator that's in the lease. Yeah. Many years go by where I do not use the 5% escalator. And I do it in part for a number of reasons. Reason number one, as a thank you to our tenants for being on our roster and taking care of the place, I will say to them, hey, I appreciate you being on our tenant roster. You've done a great job of paying on time and you've taken care of the place. I'm going to bypass the increase. Number two, we also realize that escalating rents year after year after year after year will lead vacancy. And one month or two months of vacancy can never be recovered by a 5% escalator. Right. It's good business. It's good business for us and it's good business for our tenants. And it breeds goodwill. Mm-hmm. Next topic. You want to set the stage on the Orange County one, please? I skipped over that, and I apologize. Can you set the stage on that, please? Bill McChesney has this to say. If you can get Mr. McChesney's photo on screen, I love Seville.com forward slash viewer rankings. Mr. McChesney is the mayor of McIntyre, number 15 in the family. He says, guys... They had three or four consultants for the Belmont Bridge until they came up with the lame two-lane configuration we have now. They totally blew off the underpass design like was implemented on Roosevelt Brown Boulevard. Too high a cost, they said, but once the railroad went over the railroad, once the railroad went over the railroad would be responsible for the maintenance. Talks about the consultants in the bridge. He's been around here his whole life. There goes B. Halusk. Should we do 20 (laughs) push-ups? We'll figure out something to do on Monday. All right, set the stage for Orange County economic development, please. Dozens of jobs coming to Orange County. Uh, Governor Yunkin announced just yesterday that a company called L3 Harris, one word, will invest $41.2 million to expand its Aerojet Rocketdyne facility. The investment is said to include new facilities, equipment, and tools, and it will also reportedly create 80 new jobs over the next three years. That's significant. Yeah. That is significant. L3 Harris is an American technology company, defense contractor, and an information technology services provider that produces command and control systems and products, wireless equipment, tactical radios, avionics, and electronic systems, night vision equipment, and and both terrestrial and spaceborne antennas for use in government, defense, and commercial sectors. Seeking rocket scientists. 
in Orange County. Yeah. You wouldn't otherwise think Orange County. Or would you think Orange County's close proximity to Rivanna Station and Northern Albemarle County? That's what I would say. Maybe that's what it is. Rivanna Station, Donna Price, former chairwoman of the Albemarle County Board, uh, uh, Board of Supervisors. Mm-hmm. Now on a retirement extravaganza, Donna Price. She said on today's, she said on the I Love Seville Network in months past that Almaro, the jurisdiction, buying the land from Wendell Wood to create a spy Disneyland in northern Almaro was the <laughs> second go. most important economic development commitment the county has ever made, save the University of Virginia. Wow. Dozens of new jobs with the opportunity of 80 plus was the number. Is that right? Yeah, 80 plus. Through a $42 million, was it? Uh, 41.2. $41.2 million economic development commitment. Yeah. Fantastic news. You're hearing that first here on the I Love Seville show. Let's get to the lifeguard story. We might save the downtown apartments pivoting to a 160-room hotel to the bottom of the show. And if we can't unpack that, you know, as well as we should, we can bring that to Monday's program. This story, I think, is a microcosm of so much. The city of Charlottesville, again, again, is short summer lifeguards. Yeah. Again. Last summer and the summer before that, public pools were closed because they didn't have enough staff to protect those who went to the pool. Again, on a 50 degree in April, a 50 degree afternoon in April, the city is saying, we don't have enough lifeguards to protect or staff these pools in the city. They're already setting the stage for closing public pools in the city. The pools utilized by those on the financial margin. Yeah, They're, they have less than half what they need. Did you hear that? Set it again. Say it again. Set the stage. I'll get out of your way. Uh, so, on average, uh, we hire eighty to ninety lifeguards each each summer to staff three pools. Uh, right now, they're short about forty five lifeguards. Uh, starting pay is only seventeen fifty, but uh, you can start at the age of fifteen. Starting pay is only seventeen fifty. Seventeen fifty every ten dollars an hour is twenty k. So we're talking seventeen fifty for a seventeen year old. Not not all the people they hire are going to be teenagers. The start at, you can start at fifteen years old. Yeah, and if you don't, if you're not certified, the city will pay you to get pay for your certification. They'll pay for your education as long as you obviously work for the city. Still, there's also also, but wait, there's more. <laughs> They're also offering a two hundred and fifty dollar sign-on bonus as well as a $250 bonus at the end of the year. And you can work anywhere from 20 to 40 hours a week. No deadline for applications and obviously applications <coughs> are st- currently open. How many, make it make sense. I'm, I'm, you sit in a chair, you dangle your whistle and you turn it around in a circle, you work on your suntan, you do the occasional saving of people's lives where you come across as a hero. You can start at 15. Yeah. You can make between thirty-five and $40,000. That's if you work the whole year. Obviously, you're not. But seventeen fifty an hour is nothing to sneeze at if you're 15 or 16. Right. For sitting around. For sitting on a chair. I mean, I don't know how often... Uh, and they can't, and they don't even life. have half the staff. Yeah. And the city is already alluding to the fact that, that pools will be potentially closed. And they've been closed over the last few years because they don't have the staff. Yeah, they may have to limit hours, and as well as closing some, of the, some or all of the pools on certain days. Please realize who this impacts. Our kids. What kind of kids? Uh, young one. I don't know. On the financial margin, families. Oh, that's fair. 
The pools that are being closed are not ACAC, right. are not the pools of the HOA neighborhoods, yeah. are not the pools at uh, Keswick or Glenmore or Farmington or Boarshead or right. Greencroft or Old Trail, right? Presumably. And this is a natural segue into what are teenagers doing these days for work? I'm the wrong person to ask about that. I get that, as am I. <laughs> and not to come across as a fuddy-duddy. But is today's 14 to 18 year old, the 14 and 18 year olds, when I was 14 or 18, I was working in restaurants, I was bussing tables, I was trying to wait tables, I was bar backing, I was cutting grass. I was on the, on the grind. And the summer, once we got to 16, we had to have a job. We had to have a job. It was no choice. I worked Sportsman's Grill in Williamsburg, which I believe is still there. Cut a handful of yards around the neighborhood. Had other guys in the neighborhood cutting those yards for me while I try to grow the yard base by door knocking in the neighborhood. You know another problem we have here, and this is a segue into fast food. Hmm. In the past, in history, years ago, the Burger King and McDonald's and Wendy's jobs were worked by teenagers. That was the last job I had before I went to college. Where? Mickey D's. McDonald's. They were worked by teenagers. You look at the Burger King, the Wendy's, and the McDonald's of today, and they're worked by grown ass men and women. And these grown ass men and women are using fast food jobs to try to make a professional living. And as a result of that, the minimum wage or the living wage or the wage paid to these grown ass men and women at McDonald's, Burger King, and Wendy's has gotten so high that the prices offered at these restaurants, at these fast food places, have basically become like a dining out at a sit down restaurant. Go to Chick fil A. What well, Chick fil A's figured it out, whatever the hell they're doing. Chick fil A, look at who's working at Chick fil A. You, have you been to Chick-fil-A yet? You went once. You got a pup and a cup for Liza the dog. Yeah. Judah's been to Chick-fil-A once in his entire life. Anyone who goes to Chick-fil-A, we're, we're, I, am a, I am a social voyeur. I love to study human habit and human behavior. A social voyeur. And as I'm looking at human habit and human behavior... At Chick-fil-A, I see teenagers working all over the restaurant. All over you see teenagers. It was a teenager, I believe it was a teenager who took my order when I went there. Well-trained teenagers that are willing to stand in a parking lot at a drive through lane, inhaling exhaust, taking orders to expedite the drive through lane, in-person conversation with people in cars taking their order on hot asphalt, freezing cold asphalt, or in the rain. Now, compare and contrast it to the, Mer the Wendy's, the Burger King, and McDonald's. That ain't happening. Right. Yesterday, I encouraged you to watch a bus with Charlottesville Almore Transit run or drive around the city or Almore County. When you see a cat bus, I want you to look in the windows of a cat bus. You too, Judah. And I will bet you that bus is less than 30% capacity. Every bus I see... And this is, I know, an eye test, but hey, an eye test has some value. Less than 30% capacity. If we're going to make... If we're going to utilize compensation as the sole driver of filling vacancies then we're going to price out the customers that those vacancies 
when filled, serve. I'll say it again. If we make, if the only solution we have for finding a bus driver is to pay them $75,000 in total salary, benefits, training, human resources, total package. Eight drivers, $600,000. We called it on yesterday's show. We covered it on yesterday's show. That's not saying they're making 75 k Right. And if part of that is training and certification and all that, then we might see a drop in, in that number for those people in the, the following year. Right. My point is this, though. But if it's that level of financial commitment, mm -hmm. it's going to come from the backs and the rooftops of those that Right, that need the buses to get around. Yeah. If the only way we're going to be able to afford lifeguards in the city of Charlottesville to go from a less than 50% occupancy for those stands, those lifeguard stands, is to take them over $20 an hour in compensation, the people that are going to go to the public schools, the public pools, they're going to be the ones that are taxed, whether they know it or not, for these guards. Yeah. And they're not even going to show up to the pools because they won't be able to afford to live here. And if we're going to need 60 or 70 or $80 million for Buford school reconfiguration, and it takes eight or 10 years to get that school reconfigured, the folks that we're trying to help today won't live here tomorrow. Right. Yeah. McChesney says, time and a half on that 17 bucks is $25.50 an hour if they're working overtime. $25.50 an hour puts the lifeguard at over 50 k Granted, they're not working year-round. Yeah. Oh. All right. We're going to save the... Uh, the downtown mall apartment tower to Monday. Albert Graves, thank you for the retweet. We appreciate you, Albert Graves. Close the show with the Dogwood Memorial becoming more accessible. I think that's an important one. Our veterans that want to pay homage at the Dogwood Memorial should not be risking their life crossing the bypass right playing frogger on the bypass there's a father that drives his six-year-old in the morning on the bypass to school that's weaving in and out of traffic and going entirely too fast and you're looking at him because <laughs> we're running late please don't play frogger on the bypass City Council has uh, had its first hearing April 15th about putting $600,000 to helping make the memorial more accessible. And, and I don't fault them for that. I think this is obviously something that should have been thought about. It should have been part of the plan for the, uh, the Dogwood Vietnam Memorial from the beginning. From the beginning. And it's sad that it wasn't, but... Uh, many of the veterans that, but are... But that was not the fault of anyone currently on city council. Many of the veterans are, are... Jim Carpenter highlighted this. Jim Carpenter has been a huge champion of making the Dogwood Memorial more approachable and accessible. He said mm -hmm. many of the veterans that go to the Dogwood Memorial are having a difficult time walking. They are elderly or were injured in war. Or in wheelchairs. Or in wheelchairs. And he's like, they're crossing streets and going up hills. I wouldn't want to try to get there from anywhere that I've, that I've seen. And we're physically capable. Yeah. Seriously. You should. If you, I, I'm not saying you have to do this. If you have an opportunity, maybe it's this weekend. Maybe it's Go sometimes. Go try. Go try. <laughs> with Liza. And tell us what you find. And this guy's got the balance of a billy goat. Uh, of a bobcat. I've seen Judah, like, he's got the balance of a ballerina. It's impressive. I don't know about a ballerina. Uh, you I know you have good balance. Yeah. 
Well, I'm short. You know, they say weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. What did they say? <laughs> you never heard of, you don't remember weeble wobbles? No. They're, uh, they're little toys. They're almost like uh, large Lego people, except they've got a, a, weighted, uh, a weighted base that lets them you know, go back and forth like that without falling over. And this, you, you, there was a, an ad jingle. We should do that show on ads. Yeah. Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. <laughs> what are you doing this weekend? Any plans? Oh man, I'm uh, I'm thinking about seeing if my mom wants to wants to check out the the symphony. Uh, I I really like um, when they come on today, manana. I really like Ravel, and uh, and they're they're doing uh, what sounds like a very interesting version of Bolero. So, who knows? We'll see. Let us know how it goes. If I go, I will. The refined Judah Wickower. I like it. I'll be at a Little League baseball field. We have Little League pictures. We have a baseball game. We have uh, some squash that will be played. Maybe a family lunch uh, at either a dairy market or a local brewery. I'm frankly a huge fan of Riverside on High Street. Um, I am as well. Should be a good weekend. Um, he's Judah Wickower. He's a not just the director and producer of the talk show, he's a co-host. He's a good man. Uh, my name is Jerry Miller. It's the I Love Seville show where all we want to do is be the water cooler of information for the community. So long, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Have a nice weekend.